Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the June 2021 CTS Us Quiz. What a year it's been. We're in June already. Well, anyway, I have 10 great cases for you, and I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, let's get started. In this 23-year-old female, the least likely diagnosis is... Well, in looking at these images, you see a large vascular mass in the liver. 23-year-old, my best guess, and in fact, the correct answer would be a fibrolamella hepatoma. Hepatic adenomas occur in young females, obviously, particularly patients on birth control pills, and they can be very vascular. Hepatic adenomas are often considered premalignant for hepatoma. FNH, I don't particularly like. FNH is usually more homogeneous, so... I don't think that's a good answer, but the worst answer is hemangioma. Hemangiomas on arterial phase imaging have peripheral puddling. They then fill in over time. When a lesion is hypervascular like this, I'm thinking hepatoma. I'm thinking fibrolamella hepatoma in a younger patient. Hepatic adenoma is right up there. I don't like FNH, but I really don't like hemangioma. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with left upper quadrant pain is... Sometimes when you see big cystic lesions, the biggest challenge to me is determining where the lesion is. Now, this is really cystic and it's well-defined. Splenic cysts, although they're benign, can cause symptoms. They can push on the stomach, causing early anxiety. They can push on the diaphragm, causing diaphragmatic pain, or just be mass-like and palpated by a clinician doing a physical examination. This is not the appearance of a splenic infarct, obviously. Melanoma and lymphoma obviously involve the spleen, but there the masses are solid. They can be solitary or multiple. They can be diffusely infiltrating, but they're not purely cystic. Melanoma is a tumor that gives cystic lesions and sometimes lymphoma as well, but this is so well-defined, so sharply marginated. This is a classic for a benign splenic cyst, and in this case, because the patient was symptomatic, the spleen was removed. In this patient with abdominal pain, the most likely diagnosis is, well, you do see some bowel dilatation, so you could think about small bowel obstruction, but when you look carefully, it's the classic appearance, sort of a sock-like appearance of an intersusception. So in a sense, you could have C and D both be correct, potentially. Maybe this intersusception, which in fact it did intermittently reduce itself, when you look carefully at the images, you see a soft tissue mass that is fat attenuation. This was a 7 centimeter small bowel lipoma that presented as an intersusception. Lipomas are obviously benign lesions, but anything that gets large enough can be problematic. Lipomas can bleed, but they also can cause intersusceptions. And this is just a beautiful example of one such case. What's the most likely diagnosis in this case? When I look at the images, I see a large pancreatic mass that kind of is enhancing, but not homogeneously enhancing. Then I look at the hepatic artery and it's stretched around the mass. If this was an aggressive tumor, you would expect the splenic artery, you would expect the hepatic artery, you would expect the GDA to be irregular. Now, spent tumors can be vascular, so it's a possibility. Angiosarcomas are hypervascular and they're extremely rare. They're not so well defined. Neuroendocrine tumors can be vascular, but they're usually more hypervascular. But of course, we know that neuroendocrine tumors can also be hypovascular. But when you have a neuroendocrine tumor, it typically will distort the vessel. A lesion that's somewhat vascular has this kind of Swiss cheese appearance and displaces or stretches the vessel is classic for a serous cyst adenoma. This is a wonderful example showing you how serous cyst adenomas can at times look very much like pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And again, in the right age group, in the right history, spend tumors can be up there, but spend tumors typically are more solid and cystic, they're not so homogeneous. In this patient with abdominal distension, what's the most likely diagnosis? Well, when you look quickly, you might think of ascites till you realize this is all fat. You can think of carcinomatosis, particularly looking around the liver, Maybe you're thinking about pseudomyxoma peritonei, but again, this is all fat. Lipomatosis is someone who's obese. There's no fat in the subcutaneous tissue. All the fat is within the abdominal cavity. Occasionally, lipomatosis can have a lot of intra-abdominal fat and little sub-Q fat, so that doesn't totally exclude it. But here, it's mass-like. It has septations, 
And this is a beautiful example of a liposarcoma of the retroperitoneum, mass effect and diffuse infiltration. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, when you look carefully, you see a cystic lesion which arises off the pancreas, but you see it's coming like off the edge of the pancreas. Now you could even think about a duplication cyst here. You could think about a mesenteric cyst, a lymphangioma. I guess that would be in the differential when you look quickly. But of course, I'm giving you all pancreatic choices. Serous cyst adenomas can be purely cystic. They're oligocystic, but it's within the gland, not coming off the gland. Neuroendocrine tumors can at times be hypovascular. They can be cystic, but cystic with rim enhancement. This is not a neuroendocrine tumor. Spend tumors can be cystic, but they're not purely cystic. The best diagnosis in this case is a lymphoepithelial cyst. Low attenuation, well-defined, and typically coming off the surface of the pancreas. Just a really nice example. In this patient with renal transplant, the most likely diagnosis is, well, you're looking at infection. Now, this is not the appearance typically of bacterial pneumonia. And pulmonary hemorrhage is something considered, but it's usually denser. COVID pneumonia is more of an alveolar type process involving the mid to lower lungs, not the upper lung zones. This is a really good case of CMV pneumonia. The airspace filling, very classic. You're thinking about a viral pneumonitis. It's not a fungal infection by appearance. It's not hemorrhage, as we mentioned. CMV pneumonia is the best answer. In this 30-ish-year-old female, the best diagnosis is which of the following? Well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the lung fields with multiple well-defined cysts. This is not emphysema. It's not the sequela of inflammatory disease. It's not the sequela of septic emboli. Scleroderma typically involves the lung basis with interstitial changes. EG can have cystic spaces in the lung. But when you have a female, 30-ish, and you have so many cystic lesions like this, it's a beautiful example of LAM, lymph angioliomyomatosis. A tough word to spell. I just call it LAM for short. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with shortness of breath and wheezing is, well, what do you see here? You're looking at the trachea is narrowed. This thickening of the tracheal wall with faint calcifications. That's not the appearance of sarcoid. Sarcoid is nodes. Histoplasmosis can cause narrowing of the airways. But again, you typically we see adenopathy as well, and it won't be bilateral. Wegner's can cause infiltration and obstruction. Wegner's has many different appearances in the lung. But the likely diagnosis when you see thickening of the airway, faint calcification, and a very small lumen is relapsing polychondritis. There are many unusual tracheal pathologies, and you need to know them. So it's an important uh, differential diagnosis in patients who are short of breath. Inspiratory and expiratory images can be very helpful in this scenario. In this patient with hemoptysis and hematuria, what's the best diagnosis? In this case, you see collapse of the left upper lung. There's thickening of the left main stem bronchus. Now, relapsing polychondritis usually is bilateral, but you would think about that. Sarcoid, you see adenopathy, you can see compression of the airway, not this type of pattern. Histoplasmosis, you can consider, but again, I typically see adenopathy. What helps you in this case, I also told you the patient has hematuria. Wegner's granulomatosis, classic, has pulmonary involvement like hemoptysis, ranging from na nodules to narrowing to obstruction, as in this case, but patients often have hematuria as well. This was a wonderful example of changes secondary to Wegener's granulomatosis. So with that, I've given you 10 incredible cases. I hope you learned something. I hope you got them right. But more importantly, some really challenging cases, particularly in the airways, something for you to read. We have a lot of new information on CT as Us, which can help you in this regard. So with that, have a great day. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.